Hey everyone, Roos here. Welcome to this special edition of The Pickup Show, the show where the algorithms are always accurate. In this edition, I'm going to be going over a brief, hopefully brief, review of the Euler method. And we're going to do this review in the context of Newton's second law. Let's get started. So, in general, force can depend on position, velocity, and even uh, time explicitly. And you'll notice I'm going to use this somewhat bulky notation, and you'll see that this can be useful when we get to the uh, form of the Euler equation. So we'll stick with it here. Uh, so to obtain the equations of motion, uh, the equations of motion of some mass subject to a net force F, we have to solve two first order differential equations. You'll, know, you'll uh, recognize the first one here as Newton's second law, dV dt is A, or simply divided by the net force so, sorry, divide the net force by m. And the uh, once we have the instantaneous velocity, we can use the definition dx dt to solve that. So uh, obtaining the equations of motion uh, can reduce to solving um, two first order differential equations, but it could be more complicated than that depending on the approach we take. So how do we go about solving these? Uh, one possibility is to do it analytically, and by analytically, I simply mean using a uh, non-computational mathematical approach, which really means continuum limit calculus. The other possibility is to solve these computationally, which implies we have to come up with an approximation, and the approximation I'm going to demonstrate here is the Euler method, which will get you pretty far. All right, so first of all, let's think about how we would get an analytical solution. So, and, and let's just consider the first, uh, uh, first order differential equation, dV dt. All right, so if we separate the variables here, um, the function of the net force may require us to further separate variables, which could indeed produce a somewhat complicated integral. So there's two possibilities here um, that could uh, be problematic, especially especially for uh, introductory students. Uh, the first slight problem is the integral might be too difficult. And by difficult, I simply mean that uh, the level of mathematical or calculus training for introductory students may not be sufficient to be able to manipulate and do the resulting integrals here once this uh, functional form is taken into account. The other possibility, and this isn't just a problem for introductory students, it's a problem for anybody, uh, the integral may not actually exist, and indeed uh, anything but the most, uh, just about anything except the most uh, idealistic uh, masses or situations where a force is acting on a mass um, uh, probably doesn't exist. So if the analytical solution fails for whatever reason, too hard or just simply doesn't exist, then we have really no choice but to go to a computational solution. And what I'm going to demonstrate is called the Euler method. All right, so by definition, A is this. This is the acceleration. Again, I'm using this uh, rather bulky notation, but it will be useful in a moment. So let's think about the nature of the approximation needed to build what we call the Euler method. All right, so if the instantaneous acceleration, given by this, this exact equation, if we can approximate this with a constant value, in other words, if we can get rid of this limiting case um, and shrinking delta t down to zero, if we can get away with that, then we actually have a very straightforward way to approximate what happens at some delta t after some generic time. All right, so here's the approximation. We're simply going to assume we can approximate a changing function, a of t, by its average value or by a constant value. Right? That will only be true, or we can only get away with this. In other words, it can only be a good approximation if delta t is really small. For a sufficiently small time interval, uh, just about any curved function starts to look like a, a flat, straight line. That's, that's the essence of the Euler method. Now, if this is true, and if, if we can indeed get away with this approximation, then uh, the right-hand side becomes dv, delta v over delta t, not this 
shrinking delta t to zero. Delta t remains finite. Therefore, the approximation looks like this. And after a little bit of algebra, we come up with this. Um, what this says is the velocity at some delta t later than some generic time t is approximately equal to the velocity at the earlier time t plus the product of a evaluated at the earlier time times the time interval itself. All right, so now this is why this notation becomes important. I've reduced it to a of t. This simply means that the acceleration, that function that we came up with from applying Newton's second law, evaluated at the earlier time, which means, remember, evaluated not only at the explicit earlier time, but evaluated with the position and the velocity at the earlier time, if it has that particular functional form. Right? That's has to be evaluated the earlier time, but we're using the acceleration then at that earlier time to approximate what happens to the velocity at the later time, t plus delta t. Similarly, you get something for the position. So whether it's a vertical or a horizontal position in one dimension, doesn't matter which variable we use. This simply says um, you can also solve via this Euler equation, a first order differential equation, dy dt equals v once we have v. And all we need is v at the earlier time here to approximate what happens to the position at the later time, t plus delta t. All right, well, these are the Euler equations. That, that's what we're going to apply to come up with the uh, uh, solution to these first order differential equations. And the essence of the approximation, again, is this line, this first line, approximating the time dependent function by its average value. All right, well, let's. Uh, Let's actually build this uh, graphically. Um, that's the mathematical approximation part of it, but let's let's try to uh, give a visualization of what this uh, Euler method actually means here. So I've reproduced up here the what we call the Euler equations. This is this this is the basic Euler form. Again, the velocity or position at a later time is approximately equal to the velocity or position at the earlier time plus the derivative, a is the instantaneous derivative of v versus time, evaluated at the earlier time times delta t, and the same for the position here. So let's say we have a velocity versus time graph, and this curve represents something we're interested in. I don't know what it is, uh, but it has a changing velocity that looks like this. And furthermore, let's say we know uh, the value of the velocity out here at time t, well, you could think of this as our starting point. We've either made an observation, we've made a measurement or something, and we would like to predict what happens out here at a later time, t plus delta t. The problem is we don't know the functional form of this curve for whatever reason, right? And so, of course, if we knew what that was, we wouldn't have to be trying to solve anything. So uh, we don't know what the functional form is. Either the integral doesn't exist, or it's too difficult to solve. So we're going to apply an approximation to predict what's going to happen out here at this later time. Now, this point right here is the exact value, which once again we don't know, but just graphically that represents the exact value. Okay. What we're going to do is use this red line. Now notice what this red line is. I've drawn it such that it's tangent to the velocity versus time curve right at the point t which means that this is the instantaneous slope of velocity versus time back here at time t. That is exactly this quantity right here, this a of t. And I'm using that notation specifically to emphasize that it's a evaluated back here at this earlier time t. Right? Now look what happens. It, of course, is linear and it crosses the time t plus delta t right here. For this, uh, for this specific velocity versus time curve, it actually crosses that later time at a point lower than the exact value here. So this would be the approximation. right? And so you can see clearly that there is a discrepancy or an error between the approximate value and the exact value. Again, we don't know what this function is, so there's no way for us to get the exact value. The best we can do is to make an approximation. And this, I like to call this uh, the straight line here that's evaluated, the slope evaluated back here at t. I like to call this the red Euler line. 
And so if we're doing the Euler method, this is the best we can do, although you can also see that the error is just the difference between this curve and the straight red line. And if we were to shrink delta t smaller, in other words, if t plus delta t was a smaller value, if it was down here, say, let's say it's right in the middle between these two times, if delta t was smaller such that we were considering this time, you can see the error is smaller. Matter of fact, you can see that the error between the curve and the red line does indeed go down as you approach that initial time t. And of course, it becomes exact if delta t were to be an infinitesimally small amount differing from the time t. But then, of course, we're back to continuum limit calculus. And for whatever reason, the analytical approach has failed us. That's why we're doing this computational approach. All right. So once again, this is a graphical representation of the error involved in the Euler method. And it is a pretty good visual representation of the importance of keeping delta t small. If delta t is small enough, that red line pretty well matches that curve, if del only if delta t is small enough. Matter of fact, that's going to be the essence of any of these computational approximations. Uh, uh, delta t has got to be small. You might even chant that. You might even try to try to as you're learning this stuff. You might you know delta t must be small. Delta t must be, I, I, you're, come on, join me in, jo join with me. Delta t must be small. You're not doing it, I can't hear you. Delta t must be small. All right, that's the essence of our approximation. How small does delta t have to be? Ah, that is something that we have to grapple with. And as we go through some examples later, uh, we'll demonstrate just how to assess the error and how small delta t really has to be for given situations. All right. So let's look at another slide here. Uh, the Euler method then we're going to use to predict the value of a function, let's say velocity based on Newton's second law, at a very small time later than the starting point. So here again I've reproduced the velocity version of the Euler method. Um, and you, here, here is a uh, timeline and let's say our starting point is the zeroth time or the initial time and this equation here can be applied to predict or approximate what happens at one delta t later after the initial time. So you might think, well, what does that get us? That only gets us this, this, this approximation out here at some small, you said delta t has to be small, uh, applying that thing doesn't get us very far. So if we know that, we can use this equation to find the approximation here that's all we got is the approximation out here one really small little delta t after the initial time what if we want to know what's happening out here what if we want to have a prediction or approximation for the velocity out here way way out here say hundreds of seconds later all right this applying one time isn't going to cut it but here's the answer we're going to apply the euler iteratively over and over again and all we're going to do is shift later times to earlier times for each excessive uh, sorry successive next iteration uh, wh what do I mean by that so let's say we know the again the velocity here at time zero and we apply the simple Euler equation to predict what the value is out here at Delta T um, let's indicate a few other time steps here by the way, that's a terminology called delta t, a time step. And so these instantaneous times are each separated by a constant delta t, the time step involved. All right. So let this little red blob I just popped up here, let that represent the application of the Euler equation over that first time interval from 0 out to delta t. Remember, we knew what v0 was, v of 0. We knew what that was, and we used the acceleration evaluated at time zero. We have the acceleration function from Newton's second law. So we put the initial time and the initial velocity and the initial position if needed into that expression and we calculated a of zero and predicted what happens out here at delta t. Then we simply shift everything right, and now use the approximations we just calculated at delta t as the starting point for approximating what's happening out here at 2 delta t, just using that exact same equation. The generic t now becomes delta t, so delta t plus delta t is v at 2 delta t, 
and we use the acceleration approx uh, approximated back here at delta t to predict what's happening out here at 2 delta t. And then we iteratively do it all again. That's what this next time interval is. We just approximated the velocity at 2 delta t. We put what we need from the approximations into the acceleration function and use that to predict what's happening out here at 3 delta t. And we keep doing it and eventually we'll get out here to the nth time step. right? And the velocity at the nth time is approximately equal to the velocity at the t n minus 1. Now n is just a time index here. And so n minus 1 means we're one, exactly one time step, delta t less than the current time, t sub n. And we add to that plus a. Now remember, a has to be evaluated at the position velocity and maybe time at the previous time step times delta t. All right, so that's the iterative approach we take. Now, there's one more thing to do before we close here. Uh, that's the iterative approach to the, that's called the Euler method. You apply this simple equation over and over again. Um, you could do this by hand, and the only really role the computer plays is that it calculates these things very fast for us. That's why it's useful. You wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to end up doing hundreds or thousands. Heck, you wouldn't even want to do tens of calculations by hand. But the computer can do, as you'll see, thousands of them nearly instantaneously. So, uh, one more thing though, to really emphasize the importance of having a small delta t, and this is the last slide here, um, this just demonstrates the accumulation of local error and reinforces the importance of delta t being small. Remember our chant? Delta t must be small. Delta t, I, I, I can't hear you. All right. So, uh, remember, let's say we know that this, a velocity out here, at time t, and that's our starting point. And we want to know what happens out here at some time later. So this is the exact value. There's that Euler red line. We've already gone over this. I'm just doing this to reinforce what we already saw. But let's see what happens over the next time step. So there's the approximate value, right? And this green bar here represents the error. That's the error over one time step by trying to use this red straight line to match this curve. Right? That's the exact curve. That's the exact velocity versus time. We don't know what that is. So we're using this red Euler line to approximate what happens out here at t plus delta t. And that is the error. I think you all agree that that green bar will shrink if the t time t plus delta t were to approach the time t. So we've got to keep t, t small. But here's, it's, this is even more important to watch what happens here. Let's say we want to that's, by the way, that's called the local error. This is just terminology for one time step. Let's say we want to know what happens out one more time step. Remember, the delta t always separates the times at which we're finding solutions. right? So if we're going to approximate what happens out here, we need to know the slope. And this is this iterative approach to applying the Euler method over and over again. We need to know the slope out here. Well, this red line I just popped up there is actually drawn tangent to the exact velocity versus time, right? And so I labeled it as approximately this value here, but there's two things wrong with this picture I just popped up. This slope would be tangent to the exact curve, which we don't know. And so this red line I just popped up really we, we don't know that. The only way we could get something like this is to take the values we just approximated at the time t plus delta t. What values? The values of maybe position, velocity, and, and time. We didn't have to approximate the time, of course. But we have to put those into the acceleration equation. That will give us a line that will have a slope close to this. It won't be this exact slope. So first of all, this red line isn't really the approximate line, but it's probably close to it. But there's even a, a, a further problem. We're not accumulating from the exact values. We're accumulating from the approximated values, which is down here. So I've actually got to move that red line. All right? And now out here, okay, out here is now the error associated with two time steps. So you can see, at least for this particular 
uh, velocity versus time curve, we're accumulating error as we go. All right. So um, the accumulated error is another terminology thing. The accumulated local error over n time steps. In this case, I've just demonstrated two time steps. This is called the global error, and that's the real culprit we've got to watch out for. I think, once again, you'll agree if these intervals between the successive instances of time, which is delta t, if that were shrink smaller, then not only the local error over one time step, but the global error over multiple time steps would actually be smaller. This, again, is just to demonstrate the importance of keeping delta t small.